Hey everyone, ready to dive deep with us again? Always excited to explore these fascinating topics. This time we're tackling faith knowledge and reason, particularly within Christianity. Yeah, it's a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? How do they all fit together? Exactly. We've got a really interesting mix of sources for this one. Oh yeah, like what? Blog posts, some philosophical excerpts, even a podcast discussion we stumbled upon. Sounds like a good mix. Should give us plenty to unpack. Our mission with this deep dive is to distill these complex concepts into something. Approachable. Yes. Yeah. Bite-sized even. You know, those aha moments that make you rethink things. Love those. Hope we can spark a few of those for our listeners. Me too. All right, let's jump right in. First up, we're going to introduce you to Eilis Capitonicus. Okay, I've heard that name before. He's a theologian with a really intriguing take on what he calls a logical worship. Logical worship. Those two words don't usually go together. Right. That's what makes it so interesting. He even uses the Greek term agi atraya. Makes it sound even more official. It does. So at first glance, you might think logical and worship are like oil and water. They seem kind of contradictory. Yeah, but Kapitanakis argues that true faith is rooted in understanding. Not just blind acceptance. Exactly. He's challenging us to use our brains, you know, mm. to really delve into the why behind our beliefs. I like that. Faith shouldn't be a mindless ritual, right? Definitely not. No. And the cool thing is he backs this up with scripture. Give me an example. Well, like John 4.24, where Jesus says true worship is in spirit and truth. Ah, so it's not just about going through the motions. Right. Or how about James 1.27? Pure religion is about taking care of the vulnerable. Right, and resisting those worldly influences. Yes, it's about aligning our actions with our beliefs. I mean, have you ever felt like your faith needed more than just rituals? Totally. Like, I wanted to understand the why behind the what, you know? Exactly. And that's where this logical worship comes in, engaging our whole selves. Intellect, heart, the whole shebang. It's about moving beyond that Sunday service routine mm -hmm. and really living out your faith every single day. Now, Kapitanakis even uses this word mechanism to describe logical worship. Mechanism. Hmm. Sounds a bit technical. I know, right? Yeah. But he's not talking about a rigid robotic process. More like a framework, maybe. Yeah, something that helps us approach faith in a way that leads to real transformation. So it's not just about understanding. It's about that understanding leading to action. Absolutely. It's about becoming more like Christ in how we interact with the world. And let's not forget the Holy Spirit's role in all of this. Oh, yeah. Crucial. Kapitanakis emphasizes that we can't do it on our own. It's about surrendering to God's guidance, letting the Holy Spirit empower us. It's like a dance, you know? We bring our willingness to learn our open hearts. And the Holy Spirit meets us there every step of the way. Now, this whole thing about approaching faith with both our heads and our hearts. Got me thinking about the limits of human knowledge. Oh, how so? Well, I was reading this blog post about why God might choose faith over just giving us all the answers. Interesting. Why wouldn't God just hand us a rule book, you know? The argument is that God, as this infinite being, simply surpasses our ability to fully grasp him. You mean like our brains are too small to handle it all? Kinda. It's like trying to fit the ocean into a teacup. That's a great analogy. No matter how much we learn, there's always going to be more beyond our reach. Exactly. So faith steps in not as a rejection of knowledge. But as an acknowledgement of its limits. Right. It's about trusting that there's more to reality than we can fully comprehend right now. Accepting that mystery is okay. Even embracing it. So our understanding is always a work in progress. But that doesn't mean we can't have a relationship with God. It just means we approach it with humility and an open mind. And, you know, this idea of faith amidst ever-evolving knowledge really resonated with me. I get that. I mean, think about how much scientific and theological understanding changes over time. It's constantly evolving. Makes you wonder if we built our faith solely on current knowledge, wouldn't it be super shaky? Like building a house on sand. Exactly. Faith offers something more solid. A foundation that can withstand those shifts in understanding. It's not dependent on the latest scientific discovery or theological debate. Right. It's rooted in something deeper. Something timeless. It's like having that compass that always points north. No matter how much the landscape changes around you. So knowledge can deepen our faith for sure. But it's faith that provides that enduring sense of connection with God. That unshakable sense of direction. Speaking of brilliant minds wrestling with faith and knowledge. Ooh, are we going there? We are. Let's talk about Isaac Newton. <laughs> the gravity guy? The one and only. But his views on faith were just as fascinating as his scientific discoveries. 
I've heard he had some pretty unconventional beliefs. He did. He rejected the traditional doctrine of the Trinity. Whoa, big deal back then. Huge. He was absolutely convinced there was only one God the Father. And that worshiping Christ as equal to God was a form of idolatry. You got it. He felt very strongly about that. Almost makes you want to peek into his lab notes, right? <laughs> Imagine equations scribbled alongside theological debates. From what I've read, Newton believed true religion was about worshiping God directly. No intermediaries. Things like saints or relics. He saw those as distractions. Even obstacles to a genuine relationship with God. Makes you realize that even the greatest scientific minds grapple with these big questions. Absolutely. Faith, idolatry, the nature of God. It's a conversation that continues to this day. Definitely makes you think. It does. And it perfectly sets us up for our next topic. Can't wait. But we'll have to save that for part two. Stay tuned, everyone. You won't want to miss it. Okay, so... You know how Newton had those strong opinions about idolatry? Yeah, rejecting anything that took focus away from God directly. It got me thinking about this blog post I found about faith and those systems we built around it. Oh, yeah. What was the angle? Well, it used this metaphor about new cloth and old garments. Interesting. What do clothes have to do with faith? It's about the tension between trying to fix old systems versus creating something new. I think I'm starting to see where this is going. So imagine trying to patch a tear in an old garment with a piece of new cloth. The fabrics wouldn't match. It would look yeah. all weird. Exactly. And the patch might even make the tear worse. Because the new cloth would pull against the old, weaker fabric. Right. So the blog post argues that sometimes we get so caught up in critiquing existing religious structures. That we miss the opportunity to create something better. It's like we're so focused on patching the holes that we forget we could weave an entirely new garment. With stronger threads and a more vibrant design. Okay, so how does that relate to faith specifically? Well, the post draws a parallel with the teachings of Jesus. Okay, I'm listening. It suggests that Jesus presented a new garment, so to speak. What do you mean by new garment? One that's woven from values like spirituality, love, forgiveness, peace, justice. Those core principles he emphasized. Exactly. It's not about clinging to outdated rules and rituals. But about embracing those timeless values that form the foundation for genuine transformation. It's funny because sometimes I find myself getting lost in those theological debates. You know? Yeah. I know what you mean. Like, what's the right way to do this or that? But maybe it's simpler than that. Maybe it's about focusing on those core values that Jesus embodied. Living them out in our daily lives. Yeah, like what would Jesus do kind of thing. Exactly. It challenges me to constantly evaluate my own actions and motivations. Am I clinging to the old out of fear or embracing the new out of love? Because sometimes letting go can be the most faithful act. Now, speaking of challenging assumptions, we've got to talk about Bertrand Russell. The philosopher. The one and only. He was a huge advocate for logic and reason. But he wasn't exactly known for his religious beliefs, was he? Not really, but here's the thing. Even he acknowledged that scientific principles require a degree of faith. Wait, really? I wouldn't have guessed that. I was surprised too. But he made this really insightful point about the foundations of science. The things we take for granted as truths. Can't actually be definitively proven. You mean example. Like the ex existence of an objective world or the principle of causality. We assume these things to be true, but can we actually prove them beyond a doubt? Not really. We accept them based on faith, a faith grounded in empirical data and logical reasoning. So it's not a blind faith. It's a faith informed by evidence. Right. It's not about choosing between faith and reason. It's about recognizing that they both play a role in our understanding of the world. Even in science, which Russell himself saw as a collection of hypotheses. The best explanations we have based on the available evidence. That's so interesting. It ties back to Kapitanakis' idea of logical worship. The interplay of intellect and trust. Both science and faith require us to use our heads and our hearts. We use reason to investigate and explore and faith to bridge that gap between what we know and what we don't. It's like this constant dance between the two. Speaking of interesting connections, I came across this blog post about confession. Confession? As in admitting you did something wrong? Yeah, it might seem like a jump from science and philosophy, but stick with me. Okay, I trust you lead the way. The post was about how confession plays a vital role in relationships. Because it allows for forgiveness and healing. Exactly. Confessing our mistakes and shortcomings can be incredibly cathartic. Like a weight lifted off your shoulder. It clears the air and allows for genuine reconciliation. But how does this connect to faith? Well, the Post argued that genuine faith isn't just about inward beliefs. 
It's about outward actions that reflect those beliefs. Right. And confession is a powerful way to put those beliefs into practice. Especially when it comes to mending broken relationships. It shows that we're willing to take responsibility for our actions. And to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Which brings us back to Kapitanakis's logical worship. It all comes full circle. It's not enough to just understand theological concepts. We have to live them out in tangible ways. And confession is a perfect example of that. It's about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Showing the world what our faith truly means through our actions. Okay, this next one blew my mind. We found a blog post that used the whole red pill, blue pill analogy from The Matrix. To talk about faith. That's a new one. I know, right? But it's so brilliant. So for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. It's about this choice between two realities. The red pill reveals the harsh truth about the world. While the blue pill lets you stay in blissful ignorance. And this blogger connected that choice to embracing the truth of the gospel. Whoa, so the gospel is the red pill. In a way, yeah. It's about choosing to see the world as it truly is. With all its brokenness and beauty. Even if it's uncomfortable. Because that truth sets us free. The post highlighted three key elements of this transformation. Okay, break it down for me. First, there's information which leads to knowledge. Makes sense. Then there's awareness which allows us to experience that knowledge in a deeper way. So it's not just head knowledge, it's heart knowledge too. Exactly. And finally, there's truth which empowers us to live a life of freedom and purpose. It's like waking up to a whole new reality. One that's more aligned with who we were meant to be. Have you ever had a red pill moment? Oh, totally. That moment when a truth hits you so hard it changes everything everything. It could be about yourself, about the world, about your faith. And it completely shifts your perspective. It's like those blinders come off and you see things with fresh eyes. And that's the kind of transformation this blogger was talking about. Embracing truth, even when it's difficult, can be the catalyst for incredible growth. Okay, before we wrap things up, we have to touch on this last blog post about spiritual leadership. Oh yeah, that one was thought-provoking. It talked about the tension between ambition and humility. Which is something I think we all struggle with to some extent. Totally. Because it's so easy to get caught up in wanting recognition or influence. Especially when we're passionate about something you know. But the Post made a great point that true spiritual leadership isn't about power or prestige. It's about serving others. Putting the needs of the community above your own desires. Leading with humility and compassion. Like Jesus did. Exactly. He was the ultimate example of a servant leader. And that applies to all of us, whether we hold a formal leadership position or not. It's about recognizing that we all have the potential to lead in our own unique ways. To use our gifts and talents to make a positive difference. But we have to do it with the right heart. With humility and a genuine desire to serve something bigger than ourselves. And, you know, thinking about leadership made me consider those qualities we admire in others. What makes us want to follow someone's lead? Is it their charisma? Their intelligence? Or is it something deeper? something that resonates with our souls. Because true leadership, the kind that leaves a lasting impact, always comes from a place of authenticity and genuine care for others. Wow. I feel like we've covered so much ground in this deep dive. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? From logical worship to red pills to Isaac Newton's take on faith. My brain is definitely buzzing with all these new insights. It's amazing how these seemingly different ideas all connect in such profound ways. It's like we've been piecing together this giant puzzle and you've been an awesome guide helping us see how all the pieces fit together. Well, the real fun begins when our listeners take these pieces and start building their own puzzles. Connecting these ideas to their own experiences and beliefs. That's what we hope for with these deep dives, you know, to spark those aha moments and get people thinking. Exactly. So as we wrap things up, what are some key takeaways that you hope our listeners will remember? Hmm, that's a good question. I think one of the biggest things we've seen is that faith isn't about checking your brain at the door. It's not about blind acceptance or following rules without understanding. In fact, I'd say a truly vibrant faith actually thrives on asking those tough questions. Seeking deeper understanding and wrestling with those big mysteries. It's like that concept of logical worship we talked about. Right. It's about approaching our faith with both our hearts and our minds. Letting reason and revelation work together. And remember what Bertrand Russell said, even scientific principles require a degree of faith. It's not about pitting faith against reason. It's about recognizing that they both have their place in our pursuit of truth. And speaking of truth, that red pill analogy was super powerful. Wasn't it? 
It's a call to embrace truth, even when it's hard. Because that's often where the most growth happens. It's about being willing to see the world as it truly is. Even if it means letting go some comfortable, but maybe outdated beliefs. Which ties nicely into that metaphor of the new cloth and old garments. Sometimes it's not about trying to fix what's broken. It's about having the courage to create something new. Something more aligned with those core values of love, compassion, and justice. The values that Jesus embodied. And throughout this whole journey of faith, knowledge, and reason. Humility is so important. It's about recognizing that we don't have all the answers. Being open to different perspectives. And approaching our faith with a sense of wonder and curiosity. And remembering that we're not on this journey alone. We have the Holy Spirit to guide and empower us. So as we leave you today, we want to leave you with this thought. How can you apply what we've talked about to your own life? What resonated most deeply with you? And how can you take these insights and turn them into actions? Actions that make a positive impact on your life and the world around you. Keep diving deep. Keep seeking truth. Keep that spark of curiosity alive. Until next time, happy exploring.